ago, Stephen King tweeted, I stand with Nina Jankowitz. I responded that Nina was one of the best people I knew and that I'd been a fan of his for 40 some odd years. I couldn't believe the reaction that this benign comment got from the army of people out to get Nina. It got to the point where I considered, or actually I did start blocking a few people, and I had initially responded to a couple, and then I realized, uh, based in part on Nina's advice from her book, that I should probably just mute them and not worry about what they were saying, screaming out to the void. One good thing that came out of the post, however, was I came to the attention of a guy named Keith Knight, who is a libertarian, and he is the guest on the podcast today. Keith was actually inviting me to be on his podcast, which, if I'm not mistaken, will actually be posted tomorrow. He wanted to know my perspective as a history teacher, uh, what students learn, what they don't learn, what the misperceptions are in society, and so forth. It was an incredibly cordial interview where he shared some of his ideas and I some of mine, and it gave me the indication that this was an individual who was interested in civil discourse, who thought that ideas are best when they are shared with one another, that listening to another person, uh, even if you don't agree, is a good thing, rather than retreating to our little bubbles and yelling about the people that we disagree with. Now, my podcast is in season three, and I decided that the third season would be a themed season about the marginalized people in our society. Actually, originally it was going to be specifically about black people, but I thought I should actually expand it. I also planned on a season four of guests who I disagreed with. I wanted to promote the idea of civility, of conversation, of dialogue. And so I asked Keith uh, right away if I could interview him, and we just conducted this interview. And I wrestled with the idea of whether I should hold it or how long I should hold this interview before airing it. And I ultimately decided that I would just start airing season four in the middle of season three. At the end of the day, if somebody comes to the podcast in six months, they won't know uh, other than if they look really closely at the publication date. In any case, here is the first of my interviews for season four. Keith Knight is the managing editor of the Libertarian Institute, your one-stop shop for books, podcasts, blogs, and videos on libertarianism. Keith Knight, welcome to Bob's Just Asking. Bob, appreciate you having me on. So what is Keith Knight's origin story? When did you become politically aware? When I was probably like 10 or 11, I was dragged to Sedona against my will to see my grandparents. And it's hard to appreciate the Sedona beauty of Arizona. So uh, as a kid, it's not like I wanted to go out. We would just stay inside and I would count the minutes down. And uh, they... My grandparents, uh, along with uh, my father, were usually talking about how the world is operating, uh, very much anti the current Bush administration at the time, and uh, very excited about Barack Obama, more or less seeing the world as an unjust place in the state of nature and needing uh, one group to sort of intervene on behalf of achieving justice. And the best way to do this would be sort of a democratic uh, method of approaching the world that allows everyone to have their voice heard through the process of voting. I was very compelled by this along with uh, his ability to stand up to the military-industrial complex and the uh, atrocities at Guantanamo Bay. You have, uh, I mean, almost 100 people from Yemen in there by the time Barack Obama gets into office. They're there without trial. Just something totally unjust of any other country. China, France did that. We'd see it as absolutely wild. So 
seeing blatant injustice like that, seeing the ridiculous cost of healthcare in America, I was more or less motivated to get interested in well, what is going on here. It seems like we have the answers at this table, yet no one coming out of the television is having these things. So uh, it was probably my grandparents in Sedona I would have to give my uh, m- my initial origin story to. Um yeah, I haven't told that in a while, but if I had to pin <laughs> it on it, yes. Thank you, Grandma and Grandpa. Rest in peace. So when when did it shift to to your current belief uh, system, you know, libertarianism? There was a discussion around high health care costs uh, under Barack Obama's administration. So George Bush had just passed a Medicare Part D and... Lo and behold, it uh, did not decrease the cost of health care um, any more than uh, implementing things like Medicaid or uh, Food and Drug Administration expansion. So that was a little disappointing. Barack Obama had a plan. Um, originally, it was the public option, but later we know this as the Affordable Care Act. And there were a number of costs and benefits that came along with this very in-depth economic discussion, all dealing with potential trade-offs, short-term effects on some groups, long-term effects on many other groups. Very complicated. One aspect of the legislation that I did not agree with is referred to as the individual mandate. This means that uh, people would be required to buy health insurance And the state would decide which health insurance is a legitimate organization to purchase from. At this point, I had sort of deviated from the uh, Obama plan because I still thought people should be able to opt out of things. I'm shocked to see, I don't know if you've seen the Jackass movies, but for some reason or another, there are people uh, that take crazy risks for whatever reason. So I don't know. I think people should get health insurance, probably. But I don't know for a fact so clearly that I'm willing to put them in jail for it. And that essentially is the dividing characteristic. It's not that, well, I don't care about uh, those who don't have access to things. I, of course, want a lot of people to have access to these things. That's why I advocate things like competition, profit incentive, voluntary exchanges, um, I think this is the best way to allocate resources. So the switch really came when I said, this is the aspect that I disagree with in the Affordable Care Act, the individual mandate. I then later applied that to virtually every other aspect of uh, what the government does. And herein lies the difference between government and any other organization in society. So while... uh, We can basically uh, try to persuade each other as much as possible. We can say, I'll pay you to do something. I'll give you my time in exchange for your time. We can do everything up to threatening people's well-being or any property they've justly acquired. Government, however, is held to a different standard in that capacity, where they have the right to do things that no one else would have the right to do. So whether it's forcing you to uh, uh, purchase medical insurance, forcing you to chip in for uh, a military operation, forcing you to chip in for educational policies or uh, welfare attempts to uh, improve the well-being of uh, those in poverty. That is the unique defining characteristic of government, what we're talking about here. So once I sort of uh, honed in on that as that being the difference between things I support and things I oppose, it led me down the path of really not having any double standard for the state. So for every shortcoming that exists in the voluntary sector, in any other realm of society, there's greed, corruption. There's people who are just so overly competitive, they, you know, miss the forest by staring at one tree. All of those shortcomings exist. I don't think any of them are solved by giving some people, the state, the right to do things no one else has the right to do. Because certainly if I don't have the right to, uh, say, force people to donate to the Libertarian Institute with the threat of imprisoning them, well, then I don't have the right to vote for Mark Kelly or Kirsten Cinema to do that on my behalf. So the switch came from Obama support to Ron Paul support, I, I guess you could say. Um, well, his book, The Revolution, helped. And 
that it was just me no longer having a double standard for corporations or uh, governments alike than I had for any other person or organization. Okay, um, let's just take a moment and have you provide a, a working definition for us. What is a libertarian from your perspective? A libertarian is someone who sees uh, consent as the root of freedom. So this would, the implications of this would be that human beings with regard to others own their own body and everything else is an implication on that. So if I say, well, people should be free or they should have liberty, well, liberty to do what? Kill, rape, steal, but light fires. That's kind of, that doesn't really answer our question. So what we could say is that you have the freedom to do anything you'd like so long as you don't initiate aggression against peaceful people or any property they've acquired through homesteading, meaning no one else has uh, mixed their labor with the land, or through voluntary exchange. That is what a libertarian essentially is. The, the way that we see this in the real world, outside of the philosophical realm, is anytime you do something, whether it's spend time with a friend or maybe have a house, kids, and a lot of money, you're always trying to achieve your ends through any actions you have. There are two ways you can achieve your ends, voluntarily or violently. The libertarian says if you want to be free, that freedom is the only morally justified way for human beings to cooperate with each other. So in this realm of cooperation, we can either do things voluntarily, through persuasion, through trade, or we could do things by threatening other people, where only some people have the right to uh, threaten other people. This commonly is uh, known as the state, but it could be non-state actors. It could be your neighbor who is a kidnapper. There's human trafficking rings. What makes these things different, slavery from employment, trade from theft, rape from lovemaking, is the voluntary aspect. So the libertarian places voluntarism at the heart of all human interaction and says that's what differentiates justified behavior from unjustified behavior because it allows people the most liberty to um, use their human faculties as, uh, as they wish. Tell me a little bit about the Libertarian Institute. You, I believe you're the managing editor for the, uh, for the organization. I love the website slogan, uh, whatever it is, we're against it. Uh, it's nice that someone has a sense of humor over there. Yes. Uh, so basically, if uh, this was started by a gentleman named uh, Scott Horton, he is the author of a book titled Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. Still relevant today. It's a great history of the war on terror from 1953 with uh, U.S. involvement in Iran up to Yemen in 2021. So it's it's a great history of everything that has happened there. Scott and Sheldon Richmond, who is a uh, author with regard to any topic on libertarianism, basically are collecting a huge archive of a ton of material that they feel is <clears throat> very relevant to uh, political topics today that is not getting addressed in uh, in the mainstream. Sheldon approaches things through uh, the lens of uh, social cooperation, meaning Anytime we do something, even if I'm playing solitaire by myself, well, I didn't invent cards. I didn't invent the ink on the cards. I didn't invent the game solitaire. I'm in a house that I didn't build. I, anything you do, essentially, is the result of social cooperation. So that is Sheldon's great contribution. Scott's great contribution is in the foreign policy realm. Um, uh, they are more or less the founders of the Libertarian Institute. Our general goal is to uh, get an archive of a ton of knowledge and give it out uh, to people for free so they can have access to a lot of material that has, uh, has been uh, rather underappreciated. When it comes to the slogan, whatever it is, we're against it, it's important to have a strong default unapologetic position when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to going into a certain topic. So if I say, um, uh, I think that uh, the Church of Scientology should have the right to rule over everyone else, uh, now let's talk about the costs and benefits of some of these laws that the Church of Scientology would implement. You know, before getting into anything like that, you might just say, you know what, I'm already against that. I don't believe 
the Church of Scientology should have the right to rule over anyone else. Or if I said, uh, you know, I think um, there's a lot of third world countries that are totally backwards and the U.S. needs to go in there and start calling the shots. We need to have a, a policy of colonialism. Instead of saying, well, what would these policies be? How much would they cost? What are the cost benefit analysis? Uh, do we have the number of troops necessary to do this? Instead of even uh, conceding that point that some people have the right to rule others, I think a wise person will say, whatever it is that you're going to say we are against, because we've already conceded the ground that this group of people has the right to do things that no one else does. So while it appears to be rather flippant, whatever it is we're against it, they're very close-minded, uh, there actually is some reason behind it. Because if I say that, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of something relevant that would be uh, a little more. Uh, take the example that uh, the, the feminists will often use of it's totally unjustified for men to have rights that a woman doesn't. Say we're in Saudi Arabia. If a man could drive, well, certainly a woman could do so. For whatever justification there is for men driving, same thing would apply to a woman. They're both, you know, rational adults, whatever. So if I were to say to the feminist, men should have the right to make laws and women should have the obligation to obey those laws, you wouldn't say, well, uh, let's run the experiment and then see if it works. Well, what, is by, what does works mean? By what metric? And, and 50 other things. And even if you could, you know, civilize the barbarians, so to speak, in any way, one religion rules over another, one gender rules over another, it still wouldn't justify you taking away someone's human capacity to reason for themselves, make their own decisions, and cooperate with people voluntarily. So when I say whatever it is, we're against it, uh, we're already against the next war. We're already against the next uh, regulation that is going to make it harder for people with the least amount of resources to compete with the Amazons or the Walmarts. We're already against it. We don't even want to concede the uh, playing ground to them because, frankly, they're very good and they have a lot of propaganda. So it's uh, it's kind of difficult. So we try to stop them in their tracks and say, whatever it is, we are against it. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I hope that brings a little sanity into uh, what might seem like a flippant remark. I understand the context. Um, how uh, you, you have a podcast that you call uh, Don't Tread on Anyone, and uh, I was happy to be a guest on your show. Um, how has running an ideas laden podcast impacted you over the time that you've been running it? Have you changed your views on anything as a result of dialogues with your guests? Yes, uh, there have been a number of things. For example, the importance of well, let me write these down before I forget. So, if we <laughs> take, I, I, I got to keep a running list of these. Just, I just need a humility chart. Right? Every time I'm wrong, I got to put, put, write it down and then put a tally yes. on how wrong I was. Scale of one to ten. I love so that. Let's take. Um, I, but uh, I was raised in a uh, Jewish household, and I uh, started the show. And someone said, "Hey, we'd love for you to write a section on um, uh, on what's going on in uh, in the Middle East." Turns out, I had not exactly had an accurate understanding of the origins of Israel. There is something referred to as Nakba Day, May fifteenth, nineteen forty eight, and we would actually celebrate this day as the founding day of the country. So founding, it's sort of like when you find a lost treasure, you, you're just looking around and then it's founded. Uh, that's not actually what happened at all. It turns out they had, uh, it, it had to uh, persuade a lot of Jews to get there. And then they bombed themselves into existence and engaged in, uh, I, I can't think of the word, but it's general expulsion of the current population in there because you needed a dense enough group that recognized the legitimacy of the new state. About 750,000 Palestinians uh, were uh, kicked out by force, had their property stolen. It was a real atrocity. So the fact that I had celebrated something, uh, so, so not only was I ignorant of it, I had celebrated for, gosh, I was bar mitzvah at 12, but the fact that I'd celebrated something, gosh, that felt like a real scam. And that and that alone is so humbling. So because of that one thing, I go into everything else much more humble than I otherwise would have. When it comes to the concept of equality, uh, 
the libertarian can say we believe in total equality of rights. I don't have the right to initiate aggression, nor does anyone else. All people have to achieve their ends voluntarily instead of violently. We can have that as uh, an equality metric. When it comes to equality of outcome, look, if people want to pay to watch Adele uh, entertain people and no one wants to pay me, well, uh, the life is tough. Maybe I got to find something better to do, um, whatever. However, the concept of equality is vitally, mm, I, I, I don't know if I'd say important, it's really been overlooked by you know people like me in the world. It turns out there's a great deal of research that says so much violence is not the result of someone generally thinking that they were going to be assaulted and their life was going to end. It's frequently the result of humiliation and insults. So especially when you're talking about the prison system. This is uh, research done by a gentleman, uh, James Gilligan, I think his name is. And he said, there wasn't a single act of violence that I came across that wasn't preceded by an act of insult or humiliation. So anything that makes people insecure and puts them on unequal ground, that essentially says, I'm up here and you're down here. So this sort of emotional or social inequality that increases the amount of insecurity almost makes it impossible impossible for people to operate a sane lifestyle. So the importance of material equality, uh, treating people justly, uh, I think has been heavily overlooked by the right. And when I say people on the right, I'm just referring to someone who believes in uh who doesn't believe in positive rights so you don't have you have a right to seek an education or seek health care voluntarily but no one's entitled to provide it for you also uh anti-egalitarianism so uh, the right would be against anti uh outcome it just because outcomes are different doesn't mean it's the result of discrimination and what thomas Sowell called the constrained point of view that human beings are constantly limited and we generally just have a uh a decision to make between a number of bad alternatives, uh, all of which have costs and benefits. So that's what I mean when I say the right. So the right has totally uh, not appreciated the importance of equality, assuming irrationally that, well, if we give them, if we tell them they're right on this, they're just going to grab it. And then if we give them an inch, they will take a mile. There's no reason to believe that at all, because you can still say uh, it, treating people with dignity is vitally important. It's so important to help people in vulnerable situations. We just want to do so voluntarily. Um, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. There's billions of dollars that's allocated to charities every year. And we could increase that. We have things like DuckDuckGo, I'm um, sorry, no, uh, Indiegogo and GoFundMe. I've been pissed off at DuckDuckGo for a month. I, I shouldn't have even <laughs> plugged them. Uh, but please bleep that out, uh, whatever you do. Um, uh, these places like Indiegogo allow you, one, to give money at a low cost to people who need it and transfer funds. So this increases the likelihood those things will happen. And places like Kickstarter, you might say, well, uh, my $20 is going to make a difference to me, but it doesn't do anything in the long run. A lot of these will only uh, charge you if the person reaches the amount of money that they're looking for. So you can really cooperate with people all around the world to achieve your ends through this voluntary mechanism of you know, resource allocation through, uh, th through computers and, uh, and cell phones. The reason this matters is because if you have the concept, well, equality doesn't matter versus equality does matter and human dignity does matter and humiliation is one of the worst things that people can experience. It's like uh, you could really have someone violate the non-aggression principle and it'd be not as bad as being humiliated. Ask anyone who's like totally humiliated, would you rather get punched in the face 20 times by Floyd Mayweather or uh, you know, remain in your humiliated state? And they'll take the Floyd Mayweather punchings any day. So because the right has overlooked its uh, compassionate side uh, in uh, the alleged attempt, probably, to say, well, we're not giving our enemies uh, an inch, they're totally wrong. Just as they will stretch their brains to say, yeah, Je Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner and a freedom fighter. Well, uh, maybe the average uh, progressive really does care about equality. And we just have a uh, different justification as to how funds can be allocated to achieve that end. So um, the, oh, 
uh, also circumcision. Uh, I, I've seen like three videos of how much pain babies are in. And I go, wow, I've been wrong about that for 10 years. So <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, circumcision was probably the last thing I changed my mind on going, being like, no, oh, I, I don't really have an opinion versus, oh my God, that is child torture uh, is my current position. So yeah, th- those are the main three. Um, let's turn to the the challenging part of the interview, where I'm going to give you uh, the classic rejoinders against libertarianism, and and I want to hear your take on them. Um, so let's just start with uh, the FDA and meat inspection and things like that, where um, I've seen some hardcore libertarian responses along the lines of, well, let the buyer beware. Uh, and, and I personally don't want, I want to be able to know that when I go to a restaurant that it's following specific mandated guidelines, yes, coercion, but coercion for the better, for the, for the benefit of, of everyone. Of course, we know that doesn't always happen. Um, and, you know, but there, there are, there are remedies like places losing their licenses and, and so forth. Um, so what, what's your, you know, I, I, I know you've had this conversation before, so I am just curious what your what your typical response is to that line of argument. So on, uh, I'll start with the moral aspect. I do believe in my body, my choice. So if one person or three people or a thousand want to engage in a, a, in an interaction, uh, you can do anything about, you know, informing them, persuading them, warning them against doing something at the end of the day, that person gets the final say. And I don't believe anyone, the Catholic church, your mother, uh, the state of a foreign nation, Russian interference would have the right to stop you. So, uh, yes, there is an information asymmetry problem that people, uh, making the meat have a lot of information. The consumer doesn't for all, you know, they're screwing us and poisoning us. So if we have this end that we want uh, clean, healthy, what we want, uh, sanitary restaurants and we want healthy foods, we could either have voluntarily funded competing stamp of approval agencies or a coercively funded monopoly stamp of approval agency, the FDA. The existence of these agencies doesn't stop, uh, you know, any bad uh, things from ha- it, it. It's not a guarantee against any bad thing from happening. So any shortcoming that can exist, well, what if there's, you know, consumer reports or good housekeeping or underwriters laboratories are the th- uh, the main three big uh, stamp of approval agencies in America that I'm aware of. There, uh, There's a long list of safety certifications you can find uh, basically anywhere. So, you know, what if these people get bought off or what if they don't really do the inspections or what if they're lazy? All of those are possible. The difference is with the FDA, they are also possible. There are fallible human beings at Standard & Poor's regulation agency. I think they're totally corrupt and they're totally illegitimate. But they are also fallible, greedy people at the Federal Reserve who also didn't, you know, regulate us out of the, uh, the the 2008 financial crash. So in both situations, whether we have um, a coercively funded monopoly, the FDA having the final say on things like this, or we have competing agencies, all of these shortcomings are going to exist. The reason I don't support the FDA is because it claims the right to do something that anyone else would not have the right to do. So it basically says that you need a number of licenses if you want to sell things to your fellow man. Well, when it comes to needing a license to vote, we can immediately see that the poorest people who don't have access to getting a driver's license would be kicked out of this pool of who would be allowed to vote. Well, when you need uh, dozens of licenses and approvals from one group, the FDA, who doesn't have a big incentive to hurry up and get back to you, this makes it much less likely that the poorest people in the country or the world would be able uh, to start competing with the bigger agencies, that they would have less chances they would have less opportunities because they now have to get licenses, which are very costly, which take a lot of time. So these people are much more likely to either go into entry level jobs and not be able to simultaneously pursue their dreams. What this means is we have fewer companies than we otherwise would. With fewer companies, employees have less leverage. 
uh, between going, if there's only one or two company stores in the town, well, the employee doesn't have much leverage. Are you going to work at Amazon or Walmart? Pick one. But if there's a lot more agencies, which would exist if there weren't any regulatory state, that again, we're just decriminalizing capitalist acts between consenting adults here. That that's my uh, that, that's my general thesis on this point. So with fewer companies, employees have less leverage. Therefore, it's very reasonable to believe the wages of employees are lower than they otherwise would be if there was not freedom to exchange with anyone. Also, consumers, it's likely, are paying higher prices because there's fewer companies and less competition. This is the source of oligopoly, all of these regulations that you would have to comply with. Also, when it comes to things like labeling, the FDA doesn't even allow you to buy baby formula in Europe, where you can go, you can travel there and eat all the food and do anything else. Basic minimum things like this that the FDA should absolutely uh, be allowing people to do. Um, Not only does it violate the my body, my choice principle, but it results in everyone having to pay higher prices for infant formula. The average rate would be about 17.5% to pay the tariff for uh, foreign infant formula to come to America. So this makes us much more likely to have the shortage that we currently have because one group is coercively intervening in a voluntary interaction between other groups. So yes, these bad things can happen both in the realm of fascism, communism, capitalism, syndicalism, democracy, all of these shortcomings exist. The reason that I support the libertarian approach is because it gives us the ability to disassociate with bad actors. So when the FDA does screw up and they keep something off the market that could have saved hundreds of thousands of lives, as David Friedman persuasively makes the case uh, for, you know, allowing uh, aspirin and a number of uh, heart heart valve machines to be able to uh, come onto the market as they did in Europe. You know, 10,000 people die a year. It took them 10 years to uh, give it a stamp of approval. Therefore, it comes to the conclusion 100,000 people have died from this. These things can be calculated. So morally, it's people get the final say. You can do any method of persuasion. You can offer them any alternative, but they get the final say. And secondarily, it gives us much fewer options than we otherwise would have. It m- means we have less choice, we have less competition, and we have higher prices as a result of these things. So when it comes to the Food and Drug Administration, I still support decriminalizing all capitalist acts between consenting adults for those reasons. Great. Thank you for that answer. I I, I will say, you know, I, I don't... I ultimately don't think I agree, but I I think you've you've explained the position better than I've ever heard that explained. So I appreciate that. Um, Thank you for listening. Privatization of roads. That one to me is really like if I'm looking to pick a fight with, with with a libertarian or specifically to try to influence the people who might be listening in on that conversation, that's my go to. Because I just can't imagine, you know, if if people owned, I, mean, I don't know how exactly what what that would work in a in a libertarian system, uh, how we would sell off, uh, you know, whether there would be any regulation on that, or whether there'd be toll booths. You know, the, the nightmare scenario for the anti-libertarian position was there's a there's a toll booth every twenty feet. Uh, yeah, so what what's the what's the what's your take on that? So let's see if there are examples of uh, people being able to move within certain geographical areas with it, that are uh, on private land without being charged for absolutely every single thing. So one thing I could think of, probably just because I'm looking at a computer right now, is there are some websites that you do have to pay to access, that I can't just go to certain websites. If I try and go, a big thing pops up and says, you must pay. However, if I go to a private for-profit site, youtube.com, I'm allowed in for free. And they let me just scroll around there and use their servers. I get to use a ton of their stuff. And I'm not charged directly for that. Twitter.com, a private for-profit organization. Odyssey.com, my favorite channel. Almost as good as the Libertarian Institute, also (laughs) free. So here are four uh, primary examples of uh, easements. private organizations giving you access to a ton of things for free because on the back end, they are able to profit, whether it's monetarily or engage in psychic profit. When it comes to shopping malls, you have all these stores, and I guess you could imagine, 
I guess they could charge you for every 30 feet that you walked up. Oh, you're now, uh, you can't just walk around this mall and enjoy the scene. You got to start buying stuff. Uh, you, you have to pay a toll if you want to walk another 20 feet. They have an incentive to actually say, you know what? We're going to let people walk around for free at the Chandler Mall. They open at like 6 a.m. to allow the elderly or anyone who wants to just walk around. None of the stores are open, but you can just walk around for exercise. So this is people voluntarily coming together and uh, allowing people to move, transport themselves uh, without directly having to bear a cost. When it comes to a lot of roads, the businesses, at uh, certain places actually uh, fund themselves. For example, the Walmart in Arizona on Cooper and Chandler Boulevard. Um, we, uh, the, uh, I used to work there and we waited and waited and waited for the government to give us a road to our new place. And then we just hired the construction company ourselves to build it. It was the cheapest investment possible. Companies and voluntary organizations are constantly investing in infrastructure that makes it easier for their customers to access them. So you can even go into a lot of stores and just walk around. And that's you, you know, the, taking up space in their shop because they want to sell you something, just as uh, companies would have the incentive for you to take up space on their road so you could get from point A to point B. Or maybe it would be charities because uh, the, there's the uh, 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 the organization that just wants to make it so any poor person can have the right to go anywhere they want at whatever time and reach any destination. That is something that uh, could also happen. We have a lot of soup kitchens. Those could be, uh, they could allocate time to uh, transporting people instead. So roads uh, and all the empirical uh, examples have, were done by a gentleman uh, PhD at uh, L Loyola University, a guy named uh, Walter Block. Um, he's been around for 50 years. He wrote The Privatization of Roads and Highways, where he gets into all these specifics. There are thousands and thousands of miles of private roads in America, and you don't have to pay a toll every time you go across them. Good thing about a free market is that there is an incentive for people to cooperate with one another, to exchange ideas, and uh, to compete. What this does is this gives you lower prices over time than you otherwise would have. Great examples would be the cost of books has gone down because people like uh, Jeff Bezos and Amazon. The price of steel went down because of someone like Andrew Carnegie. The price of boats and railroads to transportation systems, privatized transportation systems, because Cornelius Vanderbilt innovated. The cost of whale oil drastically went down because of someone like John D. Rockefeller. So when you get the price so low, you then make it more likely that companies will be able to bear the small cost of laying out tar and painting it and having these roads that uh, they uh, will bring people into uh, other communities, into uh, other businesses, or just places to travel. I'm not sure. Maybe it's going to be billboards. I guess if I had to guess, it would probably be billboards would uh, mainly be the primary method of financing and marketing. Well, but that would be ugly. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's all there's always downsides to everything. But yeah, I guess billboards uh, would probably be the uh, the the primary one. So uh, again, we have the shortcomings of well, what what if they're constantly stopping you? Well, what if you're in East Germany to Vladivostok and there's a government who owns all the roads and they can stop you and uh, engage in tyranny and do whatever they want? Okay, there's another shortcoming in, uh, in, uh, in the opposite system. The point is, by having this system of voluntary exchanges, you're much more likely than you otherwise would be to get costs down, at, which is why I uh, gave those previous examples. The lower the cost, the more likely you are to get things provided to the least fortunate among us. Also, there's an incentive not just to uh, make yachts in the free market, which there is because then you could sell them to very rich people. But most of the great fortunes come from uh, p being able to sell something that have the most amount of people that are your willing buyers. If you look at Shark Tank and you say, uh, this is for Mormons age 91 to 93, they're going to say, okay, well, that's like 30 people. Uh, get out of here. But if you say something, here's something everyone needs. And I can't charge a million dollars, so I'm going to charge something everyone can afford. Then the sharks, the investors, anyone listening is now going to be able to access that product or service. 
just as road companies or road organizations, whatever you want to call them, would not have the incentive to charge a million dollars or thousands of dollars to get the uh, to, to get permission to use their road or to travel or anything else. So, and also uh, the the examples of uh, Vanderbilt uh, privatizing uh, railroads. Uh, you saw a drastic decrease in railroading and freight costs uh, under private railroads. Also, uh, he he didn't even charge people uh, the the price uh, to get on his steamboat uh, as they were traveling across oceans. He just uh, uh, sold food on the ship and uh, made money that way. Not because, oh, he's such a nice guy and we need to admire him. It was the profit. It was the same profit incentive that I have when I go to work and I profit off my job or I go to the store and I profit by uh, buying products or services. Uh, This is just the innovative spirit that people have when they're trying to achieve their ends. So uh, yes, roads are simply just another way of achieving your ends that could also be done uh, voluntarily. Now, the the one um, there's one uh, story uh, about a fire in Tennessee in 2010, where the local fire department refused to help because a seventy five dollar fee hadn't been paid by the homeowner. Um, I imagine that y- your your response will include something about you know cooperative organizations and things like that. And to but how how would you respond to those who would argue that if we were to shift to a libertarian um, way of life, for lack of a better, <laughs> better word, that you wouldn't have more situations like this, at least, at least initially, uh, before things get you know, things would get fixed. Because obviously, you know, we have we have terrible things happen. Terrible people do terrible things. But fire departments put out fires in my community. It doesn't matter. You know, they don't they don't check to see whether I've paid my taxes. Well, because everyone who doesn't pay their taxes is in jail and doesn't have a house that could catch fire. So, yeah, just as uh, they will, uh, if, uh, well, the private organization just wants my money. Well, if you don't give your money to the state in the amount that they demand, you won't have a house. Uh, You'll uh, be in jail and they will give you bullets in exchange uh, if, uh, if you try resisting them. So in both situations, you have the necessity to put forth money, uh, whether it's through the form of taxation or payment to the Tennessee uh, Fire Department Association. Well, uh, this is, uh, I I think this is totally uh, unsympathetic. The fire department has the resources to uh, put out a fire, rather, uh, uh, I'm assuming at a low cost. I, of course, don't know the cost. And if someone doesn't pay the fee, I think you should absolutely do it and then send them an invoice for, I don't know, $1,000. They probably would have freaking paid it. You could have made a ton of money uh, on uh, on the back end. Maybe there was personal animosity. But the existence of a state does not stop this from happening. So there are bad firemen. I would Let's put those people in the greedy category. I want a system that allows me to defund those people and disassociate with them in a marketplace. We just saw that there was a terrible murder that took place and the cops in Texas and the cops stood outside for about 70 minutes. I mean, people would kill uh, to, uh, the parents were trying to enter the building and the cops were stopping them. Sometimes the police will respond to something and they will kill the person who made the phone call. In the case of Tony Timpa, this guy called, said, I need help. And the cops ended up killing him and they caught it on their body cams. I mean, you could say, well, at, at least they didn't, uh, you know, uh, previously ask him for a $75 fee for this. Well, uh, sometimes you pay for things and you end up getting better quality than you otherwise would. So m- my general claim is, look, these firemen, I think that was totally selfish of them to not uh, try and help out their fellow human being at no cost to them. But it's not unique to the free market because if you don't give the government your money, they're not going to say, well, we're just in this for the greater good. So if you like our service, uh, then call the IRS and then write them a check. They will also uh, make sure you don't get access to things if uh, if you don't chip in for property taxes, income taxes, sales taxes, uh, et cetera. Eric Garner was famously uh, uh, put in prison for not paying the sales tax on things. So it's not like the private sector is after your money and the government sector is just after your heart. In both situations, you have greedy people that can 
uh, exploit the vulnerable. The free market allows you to disassociate with those bad actors and cooperate with different better organizations, which is why I still am in the free market camp, even after this terrible tragedy. Uh, but let, since you brought it up, um, you know, and I know you just just tweeted about this, uh, I think today or, or yesterday about about gun rights or about the second, you know, not even the Second Amendment, just about gun rights. Um, from using libertarian lens, I, I imagine then, you know, you would even include um, the regulations that already exist being problematic. Uh, automatic weapons, for example, uh, are 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 prohibited by by law because I guess the the rationale would be nobody needs an automatic weapon to defend themselves. Um, but there's there's that coercion again. Um, now the, the the question, the difficult question, I suppose I have for you would be: um, I understand the principle of opposing anyone's coercion, uh, whether that be the government or other individuals, upon private citizens or individual citizens, but. Is it, doesn't it make it a, an awful lot easier for people to coerce one another if they have access to such deadly weapons? That could be the case, or a game theorist might say, knowing that someone else might have a weapon, I'm less likely to coerce them. You have very high rates of gun ownership in places like New Hampshire or certain areas of Nebraska, and it doesn't necessarily correlate to higher violence or uh, intimidation among the citizenry. Mexico, our neighbors to the south, have much stricter gun laws and much more gun violence. Uh, places like Chicago have a lot of uh, gun laws and a lot of gun violence. So not necessarily. Uh, second, it doesn't uh, also equal that we have a lot of peace. Uh, if you take the example of, uh, well, if we don't have gun laws, well, uh, a lot of innocent people might either be coerced or might get killed. Well, it's not, should the guns exist or should they not? The question is, should one group, the state, have a monopoly on said weaponry? Because it's not like Vladimir Putin is uh, saying guns should not be allowed uh, in his, I think, February 24th speech to Ukraine. He didn't say, we're going to have everyone give up their automatic rifles. He said, Ukrainians put your guns down. We're just coming to denazify the government. Just let us have it. Well, that's basically every government's opinion. They don't want the things to not exist. They want a monopoly on these certain weapons. With that comes the most deadly approach to uh, probably any form of human cooperation. Let's take the First World War alone. 20 million deaths is, uh, are the general estimates I hear. Another 21 million people getting their limbs blown off because some people, government, had the right to wage war on other people and to conscript. Imagine if they didn't have the ability to tax or conscript or monopolize weapons, if these world wars could have been possible. Because people have that double standard in their mind, these atrocities are allowed to happen. Take the My Lai Massacre, take the Waco Massacre, or the Second World War, or the uh, Korean War. You have about a million uh, Koreans or millions of people in Vietnam this is the result of having this double standard of they get a monopoly on the weapons, they get to start calling the shots in society. So it's not that I want everyone to be walking around with tanks and nukes and all that stuff. All I'm saying is that it's much better than the alternative, which is a clear distinction between the rulers and the ruled. So even if you know the average person can't have a tank, the fact that they have uh, weapons is a big disincentive for people in the government or any other criminal organization to attempt to initiate aggression against them. I certainly think that uh, th that is the case. And even if there are many, many shortcomings in the system, which obviously there are, when you look at all the psychopathic uh, violence that is uh, done, just absolutely cruel. I'm totally on board with any uh, voluntary measure that people can come up with, any idea, just because this is such a tragedy. Only thing is, I don't advocate the state monopolizing any weapons. And I think the only reason that a lot of people do is maybe because they've said their uh, Pledge of Allegiance a uh, number of times while looking at the flag and then associating the flag with the government, that they think them having a monopoly on these weapons is legitimate. Because if I said, um, we shouldn't have gun rights in America, only the Koch brothers should have the right to own semi-automatic weapons. People would say, well, 
I don't like anyone owning them either, but I hate those Koch brothers. Okay, well, I hate this group called government. Uh, They have done (laughs) just numerous atrocities. To this day, they're conspiring with, um, or until April 3rd of this year, they were conspiring with the Saudis to uh, engage in a mass murder campaign in Yemen. I mean, uh, those are the things you don't hear about. It's like 111,000 deaths as a result of this. So this is the unseen cost, not because it can't be seen, because it's not put on the TV. So recently, uh, 21, I think, uh, people were killed in this recent mass murder that took place. Just absolutely horrible. About 166,000 people die every single day. It's a total tragedy. I support any voluntary method of helping those people out. What I don't support is some people monopolizing uh, certain weapons, just in principle alone. But if you look at the history of democide and genocide, it's usually states that usually have a disproportionate amount of weapons with regard to their enemy, the civilians. Now, I I have uh, had to put aside, I have to skip a bunch of questions because you... uh... You I could are, lightning round them if you'd rather. Uh, no, no. I we, we maybe maybe we'll come back and have a, a round two if you're if you're willing down the road. Um, but let me ask you one more content question and then a couple of softballs at, at the very end. Um, what about? I mean, you you brought this up early on a, a number of times, and you know your your concern about the poor and underprivileged, um, you know, is something that I often don't hear from the lim- my limited exposure to libertarian dialogue. Uh, maybe it's there, and I just haven't haven't heard it. Um, but w- what's you know the the faith in capitalism that many libertarians have? I mean, what do you say about the status of of the poor, uh, underprivileged, and marginalized peoples who are there because of the status of their you know parents or ancestors uh, in, in our system, whether that's through racism or just generally inherited wealth? Are they just out of luck when it comes to access to quality education, healthcare, housing, and the like? Or, you know, because, you know, if, if uh, unless you have charitable organizations that are going to, to, to deal with the costs. That was a really poorly phrased question, but I think you understand the question. I think you understand what I'm saying. Correct. There are a, a, a number of ways to approach this. So if we have a group of people in poverty, the question is, which system or set of rules should we embrace that would increase the likelihood that the most amount of these people can increase the amount of wealth they have over time that could improve their uh, income mobility or their ability to access wealth? I think it's very clear with uh, studies out of the University of Michigan, as well as the IRS, that if you follow individuals in capitalist countries, you can look at the bottom you know, 20 percent, but those are metrics. Those are not individuals. The way to actually measure this is to look at Bill Jones and a hundred thousand other people in the year 1970, and then look at Bill Jones and all those people in the year 1990. And if their incomes have not moved adjusted for inflation, well, then you have an income uh, mobility problem. But when you look at individuals and their ability to increase their wealth and access to things, it's much more likely this will be done as a result of learning on the job skills and uh, being able to make more trades with more employers and engage in more voluntary contracts and have more access to goods and services because we've embraced a policy of free trade, which also increases the likelihood we'll be peaceful with other nations and you won't be conscripted and have your limbs blown off the ultimate uh, form of uh, impoverishment. So when it comes to uh, the, the existence of poor people, the existence of uh, people whose uh, ancestors had been severely uh, mistreated, uh, all of those shortcomings would exist under any society. Giving the state a ton of power doesn't uh, automatically uh, g- give people the skills they need to have the highest incomes that are there. So what I focus on is which set of rules should we embrace that allow these people to reach their full potential or have the most amount of money possible? And I believe that it is a, or, you know, believe is sort of a weak way of saying there's a great deal of research in the book Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, where he cites the IRS study and he cites the University of Michigan study that follows individuals over time and sees that uh, their wealth increases as a result of getting more on the job skills and trading with more individuals. Uh, So uh, these are both free trade principles. 
Uh, that's why I am uh, pinning the increase in their wealth as a result of capitalism. Now, when I say capitalism, I, that does not mean pro-business. I think some of the worst people in the world are <laughs> businesses. Uh, J.P. Morgan uh, the, uh, was the uh, head conspirator, you could say, in monopolizing the nation's currency at uh, Jekyll Island in 1910. You have the military-industrial complex, which Dwight Eisenhower warned us about. So uh, you have uh, you know, money-seeking human trafficking rings. You have uh, the, all assassinations, I guess. You could uh, put those in there. So it's not making money, per se, that I'm advocating here, because you can make money in all ways that violate this libertarian principle of voluntarism. So when I say capitalism, I get to that definition by defining communism as the abolition of private property, socialism as the institutionalized aggression against private property and private property claims, and then capitalism being a social system based on the explicit recognition of private property and self-ownership and non-aggressive contractual exchanges between individuals. So I am not saying, well, it's all about making money and business is business. That's a totally unjustifiable excuse that uh, should not uh, b be entertained. So that is what I'm saying when I'm uh, saying capitalism. I basically mean private property and people's ability to make voluntary exchanges. I'm going to give you two resources that you can recommend to someone curious uh, to, who wants to learn more about libertarianism. Give me two. The uh, first one would be the uh, site libertarianinstitute.org. And uh, with that, uh, you have uh, the search engine that you could basically type in anything and you will get maybe too many results. We should, uh, <laughs> we might be uh, giving uh, people uh, decision paralysis with, uh, with all the free content we've, uh, we've accumulated. If I had to recommend a single book, it might be... It might be Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. So at the Libertarian Institute, you'll find all the philosophy you can imagine to get a grounding in these, uh, in these ideas. Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell is a rather large book. However, it's so subdivided, you can look at the chapters and find something you want to just focus in on. It doesn't even have to be read, starting at page one uh, succinctly. So he gives both uh, principled, uh, approaches to things. He also gives the uh, the utilitarian approach. So he'll use real world examples of the uh, you know uh, cars not being invented in America, but the average person being able to access a car as a result of Henry Ford's uh, embrace of capitalism and uh, free exchange. So uh, because of all of the uh, real world examples he gives in basic economics, I'd say those are the two. Our Site and Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. And where might people be able to find you other than the website, the Twitter account, or anything you want to plug? Yeah, so I have a uh, channel on YouTube. I'm on I'm, I'm thin ice. I, I got two strikes going up against <laughs> me. I, I just got another one. Uh, I, I reviewed uh, Dinesh D'Souza's uh, 2,000 Mules, and, uh, and, and now I have a uh, strike pending for, uh, for, for talking about it. I titled the video "The Problem with Two Thousand Mules," and I and they still struck me. Um, I I hope the appeal goes through, though. <laughs> um, uh, I would say Odyssey.com. Uh, that is where you can find a collection of all of my ad-free videos. My whole thing is um, I try to make videos that the second you click on them, you will start learning something immediately. I try and ask open-ended questions so I could get the widest variety of answers uh, from either. You know, books that I've read that I'm summarizing or people that I'm interviewing. The, I mainly started the channel because I hated uh, Sean Hannity's show so much. <laughs> I could watch it for hours on end and not learn a single thing. And the things you did learn were completely cherry picked from, to, uh, from other things that you could be blindsided with at any time that you would never hear about. So my whole thing is to fight against the Sean Hannity's of the world and not waste people's time. So if they want to check out that video archive, they can go to odyssey.com and uh, type in Keith Knight, don't tread on anyone. Keith, thank, thanks so much for being my guest today. And uh, I'm sure people will find this episode very interesting. Thank you so much, Bob. I appreciate your time.